Our speaker today is uh, Barnabé Monod. Um, Barnabé uh, uh, earned his PhD from the Singapore University of uh, Technology and Design, um, focusing on uh, algorithmic game theory. And for the past uh, three years, he's been a research scientist in the Robust Incentives Group at the <coughs> Ethereum Foundation, where he focuses on issues involving um, game theory, mechanism design, and crypto economics for the Ethereum protocol. Thank you. Thank you, Chimek. Can everyone hear me properly? Yeah. All right. Thank you all for being here. Uh, today, I'm really happy to tell you a bit about the economic organization in the Ethereum protocol. So my aim of this talk is last week we had a very interesting workshop at uh, Columbia, the first Columbia Crypto Economics. Uh, if you didn't make it, why? It was really nice. So <laughs> if you hold it again, you should definitely come next time. Uh, but I hope that this talk is a chance to get an overview of, of the things that have been discussed there. And if you did make it, uh, there's some overlap. New York is really exciting, and, and I didn't have so much time to make the slides, so I reused some of them that I presented at the workshop. Uh, but I hope still to give you maybe a new way of seeing things that you've already heard about or, or that you might already know. So let's dive in. In this talk, I'm trying to tell you a bit about what the protocol expects from the agents that are running uh, itself. So the protocol is a set of specifications. Because we are decentralized, you want players who don't trust one another to, to run the protocol. And that leads to a series of principal agent problems, which is basically mechanism design in this decentralized environment. Uh, and so the first one I want to talk about is what I call the protocol <coughs> agent problem. So there's a thing that is the Ethereum protocol. Basically, it's a, it's a set of specifications. It's, it's what you need to do to be part of that, of that protocol. And we have a set of agents, which are called uh, validators, that the protocol expects to, to run the protocol. But do they run it honestly, is the question, right? Is, it, is honest behavior, is following the Ethereum protocol the, the rational behavior for, for agents to, to follow, for these validators? And so we have this system of rewards and penalties to ensure that people act in expectation to what the protocol wants them to do. Uh, but is that enough? And so today what I want to ask is trying to understand what the protocol is, what its boundaries are, and how the economic organization of these agents that are participating in the protocol uh, sort of follows from that. So I depict it as a uh, protocol and it delegates uh, its instantiation or its execution to this network uh, of validators. So who validates in the Ethereum protocol? So there's a distinction to be made um, there's different types of, of players that are interacting uh, in Ethereum. So the first is really the users. So there are people like you and me who are sending transactions to the network so that we get execution. We'll talk about this a bit more. But then really who runs that protocol and who ensures the correct execution of, of Ethereum is, is two sets of players. So there's one set, which is like the larger set. They're called full nodes. So they're nodes that basically servers uh, that run a piece of software that listens to new blogs, that listens to new events that are happening on the network, and just verify that these events follow the, the protocol honestly. So these full nodes, you can think of them as read-only. They're just observers of the execution of the protocol. There's a privileged set of full nodes, which are called validators, and there are people who participate in the protocol instantiation, so in, the, in two things. Consensus formation, trying to understand what is the data that we are coming to consensus on as a decentralized set of parties, and block construction. <coughs> what data do we choose to add to this ever-growing uh, ledger of transactions? You can think of validators as read-write uh, entities. So what does the Ethereum protocol instantiate? This is very basic but just so that we have a, a clear picture in our head. What we want out of the protocol is we want a blockchain. Like we want to all agree upon a canonical version of a, of a history of blocks. And these blocks, they contain two things. They contain consensus data. So if you think of proof of work, that data is very simple. It's just the hash of the previous block and the proof that you solved 
the proof of work puzzle. And they also contain executable transactions. So these are transactions that users have sent in Bitcoin, yeah, like the payment, the UTXOs. In Ethereum, the transactions, they can be more complex, they can be smart contract calls. But they're all executable with, some, with respect to some execution model. So general computation on Ethereum, uh, payments, and a bit more with Bitcoin script on, on Bitcoin. And so I really encourage you to think of the blockchain is in this modular way, as you have a consensus layer that is concerned with okay, what's like the correct data that we agree on, and the execution payload that really tries to interpret uh, the, the data <coughs> we are coming to consensus on. You can think of more layers, but I'm, I'm only going to focus on this today. Okay, and so how do you become a validator? Like, how do you participate in this process of consensus formation? So in proof of stake, it's very simple. You send 32 ETH in what's called a deposit contract. So a deposit contract is a smart contract that's deployed on the execution layer of Ethereum, and you send some effort to it. After some time, the other set of validators realize, oh, Barnabé wants to become a validator. He's locked up some ETH. <coughs> we create a new validator address for him. And now he's sometimes called upon to perform consensus duties. These duties, you can think of them as two different types. One duty is block proposal. So in proof of stake Ethereum, every 12 seconds, one validator is sampled of, out of the whole set. Today the set is, I think, 450,000 validators. So if you have one validator, it's maybe once every four months, I guess. Um, and so yeah, so when, you, when you're selected, you are the person who's expected to, to produce the block. Another type of consensus duty, and this happens more frequently, every six minutes, you are asked to provide your view of the network. So you, you, you are asked, what is currently the block that is the head of the chain? And you give a response, you say, okay, the block that I think is the, the head of the chain has this hash, and that's what we call an attestation. And so when you are a validator, you run uh, essentially two pieces of software, one, the consensus client, that sort of deals with this consensus layer operation, so making attestations, aggregating them, and an execution engine, which is stri strictly concerned with creating the, the payload of transaction that your block contains. And so when you are called upon to make a block, uh, this process outputs one block. It's strung together, they create a blockchain. What about the reward? So why do I want to lock up my 32 if in the contract? I don't do it because I think it's fun, although it's fun, but I also do it because I think I might get something out of it. And what I get out of it is rewards and sometimes penalties. So the protocol has ways of checking whether I'm doing my job correctly or not. If I do it correctly, I get rewards. If I don't, I get penalties. So the rewards, they come in two types. You can think of it as there's a block reward that you get from performing correct consensus duties. And then there's transaction fees uh, that come from the execution payload. I'll, I'll be a bit more specific about what these are in the, in the rest of the talk. And then you can also have penalties. So if you don't do your job correctly, like let's say you're offline when the protocol asks you to, to send a block, it might take a bit of money out of the deposit that you have um, in the smart contract. You do something that's attributably bad, and there's a class of faults that we can say, okay, Barnabé has just tried to attack the network right now. In that case, we do this thing that is called slash. We take a very big chunk of your deposit and we, we send it to the incinerator. So <coughs> you don't get it back. So this system of rewards and penalties is how the Ethereum protocol, which is a fuzzy concept, a set of specification, tries to incentivize validators to, to create a blockchain. The question is, well, hopefully the blockchain that results out of this process is something that looks like what the, pro the protocol was trying to, to incentivize in the, in the first place. And we hope that it's the case. There's a lot of research on why the rewards and the penalties might be incentive compatible, but I would say essentially that's what we're trying to, to get at uh, when we think of a protocol. So how do you incentivize this set of agents and how do you make sure that uh, the, the resulting output is something that, that matches your, your protocol? This is a chart that I'll come back to throughout the talk, but one question, or let's say leading question for this talk is, really what's the boundary of the, of the Ethereum protocol? So in what I describe right now is 
the Ethereum protocol has some sort of control over the network of validators that it delegates the execution of the protocol to. The way this control is affected is via the rewards and the penalties, but there might still be some room for validators to, yeah, to have some agency in terms of how they perform their work for the Ethereum protocol. <coughs> and we'll see that uh, more in the, in the next few slides. Okay, so switching gears a bit, like why do we bother at all running this protocol, right? Again, we have this consensus system, we're all trying to agree on something. Essentially what Ethereum is trying to do, or what Bitcoin is trying to do, is to supply some kind of resource to the network, right? He wants to supply uh, space for people to make payments. He wants to supply space for people to interact with smart contracts. So it needs to supply this. All of these are economic interactions that are recorded on this ledger. And all of these decentralized set of participants, they're trying to keep up with the ledger and they're trying to interpret it and follow it. And all of this is just, at the end of the day, physical resources. So I want to get a bit more into how exactly the protocol provides that supply of resources to, to the network for, for consumption. I'll start with the gas. Again, this is very simple if you, if you know anything about Ethereum. But we're trying to understand Okay, here's a transaction that is trying to activate this DeFi oracle so that it can make a payment to this person conditional on something else happening and then minting an NFT at the end of the chain. So <coughs> in Ethereum, because you have this general model of computation, you can have arbitrarily complex transactions. If you want to avoid the halting problem, you need to meter the transaction so that once they just consume too much, like they, they spend too much time to, to be executed, you kind of stop them. In, in Ethereum, how we meter it is with this unit called gas. Uh, and gas essentially is like this virtual unit of measure for, for what a transaction might consume. And if we think a bit more at a lower level, let's say you're running a full node, you're listening to blocks, and you're executing the transactions that you receive, what are the kind of resources that your full node really makes use of? I can think of three, but there's more that uh, are out there. One of them is just raw compute, like you might have mathematical operations to, to perform, adding things, removing uh, balances from ledgers. Another thing is storage. When you do these operations, you need short-term memory, like RAM. Uh, you need to remember the account balances of everyone, so that is something we call the state. You might have to remember the historical sequence of all the function calls that were made to smart contracts. So all of that is storage. And there might also be bandwidth. So if you send a lot of data through with a network, like if you call functions with many arguments, uh, it's just more, um, more congestion on the, on the Ethereum network. So all of these are different resources consumed by the nodes, but eventually they're all folded into this one unit, which is gas. You can see here the random block I picked uh, last week. The block will tell you how much gas it has used. And the blocks have a gas limit because, again, we don't want people to overuse um, the resources on the, on the network. And so with this idea of gas and this idea of supplying resources to the network, you can start to think of validators as, as block producers, or really as resource providers. Um, it lets, the protocol lets the block producers consume these resources, and, and it, it embodies in its specification various constraints to make sure that you don't overuse the, the resources on the network. <coughs> Faced with these constraints, uh, the validators are, are kind of market makers between the supply that's given to them by the protocol as gas and the transactions they receive from the users. So they, they really exist as this meeting place between the supply of resources and the demand for transacting on the chain. And what results of this meeting is the production of blocks. So how does that work in, in practice? Uh, I said that there were some supply constraints. So one of them is the gas limit of the block. Another constraint which is new in Ethereum is EIP-1559. That's something that was deployed in August 2021. And it's a market mechanism that basically requires transactions to pay some reserve price when they want to get into the block. This reserve price is dynamic. So it's able to understand if a chain is too congested in which case the reserve price will increase so that you match uh, demand with supply or not congested enough, in which case 
the, the reserve price will, will decrease. I think of it as a bit like Uber surge pricing. So if you have a lot of people who want to transact, uh, you just start raising the price until some people drop out and you achieve your, your target. And so how this works, I, I won't go into the details of the mechanism, but what you're telling yourself is <coughs> average you want blocks to use maybe 15 million units of gas, but you let blocks fill up to 30 million units. And then if you see that you have enough demand to fill your block beyond the target, you raise the price. Once the price is high enough, you just can't find transactions that are willing to pay the base fee, in which case you, you start lowering the base fee. So you use that slack as a demand signal to, to make that update. And then the update rule is just a simple multiplicative rule to, to make the price increase when it's full and decrease when it's uh, empty. And so you can think of this reserve price as really a congestion price for what is the price you need to pay to be included right now. And Tim has been doing, obviously, a lot of work on, on this mechanism, and I really encourage you to, to read his paper on, on the sub subject. Right. So EIP-1559 is great. I would say it's really achieved that the, the objectives that were set for it to, to provide this protocol price. And one issue with it, and it's more generally an issue with gas, that gas is, you can think of it as kind of a numerator. It's the thing that you price every resources against. But these prices, they are fixed. So the relative price of bandwidth and storage and compute, like they're all fixed by some kind of schedule that was made um, long time ago in 2014 and very rarely updated since. And so when you think of it in terms of just physical resources of nodes, yeah, what does it mean that three units of the execution is the same resource load as keeping one byte forever because this is part of your historical storage. So it's a little weird to have these, these fixed prices. And it's not just weird, it's inefficient. So sometimes if resource A and resource B are not competing, like they are independent in terms of the resources they, they summon, when you have fixed prices, you can only make the trade-offs on that um, almost like budget constraint. If you have floating prices, like if you let the price of resources float with respect to one another, you can be a bit better in your allocation. In particular, if resource A and resource B don't really conflict with one another, you might be able to provide a bit of both uh, more. And so, yeah, break away from this, um, let's say, inefficient budget constraint. And so this is something that we are currently looking at uh, as a way of providing better resources to the, to the network. Specifically, the first instantiation of EIP-1559, or multidimensional EIP-1559, is adding a second dimension to, to the gas market. So there's a new class of users on Ethereum. They, you can think of them as sidechains, or like extra protocol networks. They're better than sidechains, in a sense, because they inherit the security of Ethereum. But the way they inherit the security is they have to publish all the data that is executed on their network. They have to publish it as like this raw stream of bytes on Ethereum itself. And so providing this data availability, if the L1, so if the Ethereum base layer is able to provide it at scale, you can amplify by great factors um, the, the size or like the, the resource uh, that these secondary networks can provide. So this uh, two-dimensional EIP-1559, the first instantiation will be to price separately the, the data availability as a resource that the, that the network provides. So now you can think of the Ethereum protocol tells the network of validators, well, there's a certain supply of exec gas, so this gas you were using before, and now there's also this new resource you can uh, provide, and you have to make the allocation between what your users want. So regular users like you and me, we are still going to send transactions, but these rollups are going to send blobs to try and um, buy or purchase some of this um, data availability resource. And again, the network of validators outputs a block in the middle. Question. Yes. So if I can um, purchase storage via um, regular gas, or um, I can purchase data availability via um, uh, exec gas, do they have different properties like? Uh, Yes. Well, so, guarantees or something? Yeah. So the, specifically in this proposal, the data gas is not kept around forever. So after two weeks, we the full nodes won't remember the data that was published. 
This is reasonable to do specifically for rollups because what we care about is the availability of this data. Like we want to make sure that it was published to the network as a whole, but we don't pretend that this is data that the protocol provides as a storage facility. So we only care that it's published and that it stays around long enough that everybody can access it at least once and it can be indexed by, let's say, external parties. But we don't need to store it. So this data does have like much different. Yeah, yeah, and it will be much cheaper. And so, so you can still store data by using this exact gas. The properties remain the same, um, but it, it doesn't have the same properties as the as the data <coughs> gas. And so, really, when we build this facility, we really aim it at at a specific class of user, which is these uh, rollups. Little summary so far, like we're about halfway um, into the talk. So the Ethereum protocol specifies a set of rules and behaviors to follow. It can reward some behaviors, it can penalize some, but ultimately the protocol entirely delegates its execution to the validator. The full nodes act, so the full nodes that are not validating, that are not participating in consensus, they can backstop to some extent incorrect execution. So let's say the validator set is entirely captured by one entity or some nation or some company, uh, the full nodes can say, okay, this entity now is deviating from the protocol, but because they are the one running the protocol, they can also decide to make up their own rules. The full nodes can backstop that behavior. But that's, yeah, this is the, the ultimate um, checks and balances in, in, the, in the system. Secondary, the Ethereum protocol also supplies some amount of resources over time. So, the resources are costly to the network. They are costly to provide for the full nodes to, 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 to have uh, because all nodes essentially need to, to supply this. When they receive a block, they need to execute it. So all nodes um, <coughs> participate in, in, in this resource provision. And that impacts consensus formation to some extent. So if you, if you set your gas limit to be very high, then you need very good computers to follow the chain and so that the execution is, is performed uh, in time, which means that the weaker nodes that have not great hardware, they start to drop out, and then uh, <coughs> your herd immunity provided by the full nodes kind of starts to, to disappear. And so, yeah, so this supply of, uh, of resources is, is important to the, to the consensus formation itself. Are there any questions or thoughts at this point? You mentioned before that the relative pricing of the resources is rarely updated. Why, why not update that more often? Well, there's a philosophy, I guess, in the layer one that whenever you make changes, they have to be very thoughtfully considered. Having a committee that just like its role is to update the prices following some kind of law of computing or we observe, okay, what's the cost of the cheapest hardware and make prediction based on that just not super sustainable. It's, it's, it, it's just easier to have like this floating price market. And, and why not have the market to determine the relative prices of the different resources? Yeah, yeah. so this is two-dimensional EIP-1559. Yeah, so in, in this version, both resources define their price independently of, of one another. And so then the relative price are, are floating. This is a market-based approach to finding this relative price between the resources. Is there an exchange rate between data gas and exec gas? No, it's not fixed. It's a floating rate between the two. You have to find a mechanism to exchange them. It's like there's a market for oil and there's a market for iron. And they're, they're just finding their prices separately. They're consumed by different people. There may be goods that are <coughs> neither complementary nor substitutable. Uh, there's actually interesting questions on... Uh, yeah, but all it is, they could be consumed with two different people. All it takes is a third person who could consume both. Yeah. And that person will determine relative prices. So you, in all these, um, let's say, resources, some of them might have interactions. Some of them might have things where if it's consumed by one, it can't be consumed by the other. And then it's a bit more tricky. You can still have independent markets, but there is these interactions if the goods are, let's say, complementary. In the specific case of this two-dimensional EIP-1559, there's a clear separation that, okay, you either need one or the other, not 
not both at the same time. There's no interaction between these resources. And so if there's a market for each, they will both find their equilibrium price or market price independently, and then you, you just purchase it. Okay. What would you suggest is a good mental model for the preferences of full nodes? How to think about incentives for full nodes? Right. You mean full nodes that are not validators. So why would you run a full node in the first place? I can think of a few categories of actors who might want to run a full node. One of them, for instance, is you have a really high preference for privacy. And when you send a transaction, you don't want to send it through other third parties through the network, like Infura or Metamask. Well, Metamask uses Infura. But, um, and then you, you run a full node with the only purpose that this is your RPC for sending your transaction to the rest of the network. That's one. Another type of actors is dApps. Applications deployed on Ethereum might want to have their own full node so that they can track what's going on on chain uh, and not have like third party services run these nodes for them. So you can have monitoring, you can have several features you can add to the, to the full node and also transaction monitoring. Um, another type of party is if you scan, they don't run um, validator nodes that I know of, but they run full nodes so that they can publish publicly the, the data that the full nodes are, are collecting. So yeah, there are different actors. There's also a point to be made that today the model is, well, you only have full nodes. You, we're starting to see like more what we call light clients on Ethereum, <coughs> which is so this thing I was describing. I'm a user, I have great value for my privacy. I might not need to run like a full node that tracks the whole chain. I might just need to run a little piece of software that only tracks my own balance and my own accounts that I've dealt with and is able to, to forward my transaction uh, around to the, to the network. So if you had these light clients, you wouldn't have to run a full node. And then these light clients, they're so light, you could put them on your phone, your browser could be a light client, and then you have much more <coughs> um, distributed, I guess, people running them, yeah. I mean, can light clients serve as backstops for incorrect account? Today, no. But let's say there's a future where you have fraud proofs for L1 execution. The light clients could gossip among them proofs that the execution was done incorrectly and the validator set produced a block that was invalid. And your light client could tell you, okay, that block is not valid. But the assumption today is the light clients don't do any validation themselves. They just see the block header, and they're able to track balances based on that. But you could build more intelligence into the, the live lines. <coughs> Especially on L2, these rollups, uh, some of them work with fraud proofs. So there's someone who says, wait, this transaction was done incorrectly. And some that run on validity proofs, ZK snarks. And then you can have very succinct um, proofs for, for the correct execution. Yeah. I hope that we have um, that at uh, the base layer at some point. Yeah. A question. So in Ethereum, I think there is a process which we call it unbending. Uh, so what's the mechanism behind it? So do you know anything about this? So we could talk a burning or, or things like this. Is it burning? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, this is something I actually didn't even mention here, but the rule of EIP-1559 is because the protocol is quoting you a price and that price is an objective signal of demand, uh, the protocol can capture the the reserve price. You think of it as an auctioneer that, okay, now it's selling the good, it's, it's collecting the, the revenue from the, from the auction. In that case, because this mechanism is run in this decentralized set of, of parties, and again, this is a result that is in Tim's paper on it, actually, you don't have a choice. You have to either burn the proceeds of the auction or redistribute them to some kind of pool of, of, of validators. And the reason is because the auctioneer the person who's embodied with the role of the auctioneer at the time of making the block is the block producer. And the block producer is, is an agent, is, is untrusted by the protocol and could, could profitably deviate from the auction format that is imposed to them uh, if they were uh, given back the proceeds of the auction. And so that's why uh, you burn it. Well, actually, yeah, in Ethereum, the choice was made to burn the proceeds rather than redistributing them uh, 
um, so another way. Yeah. So if you've heard about the burn, yeah, this is coming from EIP 1559. Okay. So now I want to get to the second principal agent problem that uh, I think is very relevant today, something that people have been discussing a lot. <coughs> The proposer agent problem. So the first was protocol agent problem, how the protocol makes sure that people follow its rules. Absolutely. <coughs> the second one is the proposer, as a block producer, who started seeing that they are themselves outsourcing the production of their block to, to other parties. So you might have heard it mentioned as proposer builder separation. And so, yeah, in this plot, the protocol delegates to the validators the function of running and executing the protocol. And the validators start outsourcing the construction of their blocks to a new class of agents that we call uh, builders. So in the next set of slides, I want to take you on a journey to understand why and how this separation has happened and is now happening and is being organized. Uh, and I think it's a very deep question and it does put into and to question what, what the Ethereum protocol is, like what should its concerns uh, be. Okay, so why do we see this, um, this outsourcing of block construction duties? So to, to, to understand that, I, I'll start from, I guess it's a, it's a historical view of, of how this has happened. One thing that the protocol doesn't specify is how the block proposer makes the execution payload. So how the block proposer packs the transactions that they collect uh, into their block. The only thing that it says, actually maybe two things, is you can't go over the gas limit, and whatever transactions you include, they have to pay the EIP-1559 uh, reserve price. Apart from that, the block producer is free to make the block however they want. They can leave out transactions that are paying and have gas, they can insert their own transactions at the time that they are packing the block. Uh, they can order transactions however way they want. None of that is really specified by the protocol. In practice, how do browser pro make their block? So they look at the transactions that are pending in the transaction pool, and they figured out that it's relatively incentive compatible to order transactions in their block by decreasing order of gas price. So the more fee a transaction is paying, with the IP1559, you can specify a tip, which is paid above the reserve price. The more fee your transaction is paying, the more you place it at the top of your block. The reason why this is incentive compatible is because the first spot, the first slot for a transaction in a block, it has actually great value. It's, how, it's what you can use to react to all the new information that has happened since the previous block was published. So if you are arbitraging on DEXs, the prices are stale when the previous block was published. So now you have a new block, so you want to capture that arbitrage. So you want to react to that. And so that first spot is really valuable. And so if you, as a block producer, somehow commit to ordering your transactions by decreasing order of gas price, what you induce is people fighting over the first spot. And how they fight over it is, and we've seen that in practice, is a very nice paper, Flash Boys 2.0. What we've seen is here is two bots that over time are monitoring one another in the mempool making bids, so pu putting like some kind of priority fee and trying to up outcompete one another by, by raising their, their, their tip. And so what happens here is what we call a priority gas auction, PGA, and, and it can really, yeah, the, the levels that the auctions can rise to is, is fairly high, maybe thousands or, or millions of dollars when the first spot is, is super valuable. So this is why uh, block proposers tend to make their blocks in the decreasing order of, of gas price. What this tells us, <coughs> and it's a bit of a more abstract view of finger mind, is that the ordering of a block really matters. So there's value to acting upon some state of the world that is currently on chain. So if the state of the world or the state of the chain, let's say accounts and balances, uh, is S, if there is a value V of S that you can receive, 
that value really depends on what the state currently is. So if you have the first spot, if, you, if the arbitrage still exists by the time you put your transaction in, you might make a million dollars. But if you do the same transaction on the state where the arbitrage has already been done by someone else, now your value is just zero. And so whoever is trying to capture this arbitrage is willing to spend up to a million dollars to, to, to get uh, the right to act upon the state where the arbitrage still exists. And so ultimately, who is the best placed actor in this system to capture the arbitrage? It's the block proposer. So the block proposer is the one making the block, the one deciding on the ordering of transaction. And so if they know that the arbitrage exists, they just insert their own transaction that takes siphons of the million dollars and they make up with it, make away with it. Block proposer is, is sort of a monarch on, on the particular block it has. So for a short amount of time, they are like the absolute leader of what happens on chain. They are the ones controlling the, the state transition. And so how do you allocate this first? I want to go through like a few options and to maybe give you a sense of yeah, alternatives that exist and, and why the market has sort of organized around how it is uh, organized today. So the first one is what we've already seen is we don't make any kind of allocation mechanism for the first lot. We just let it play out, and then what we see is this parity gas option. Block proposers are, it's incentive compatible for them to choose the decreasing gas price. And then you see these ad hoc uh, English auctions. But they are fairly wasteful. First, because when these bots are competing in the transaction pool, that's a lot of traffic. And then the bot who wins makes away with the money, and there might be a dozen bots who still have transactions, and the transactions they get included because they are fee paying, even though they don't do anything. Uh, but they just clog the chain with unnecessary um, data. <clears throat> Another way to do it is you could say, well, what if the block proposer just, when they make their block, randomize the order? They take a, a batch of transactions that are fee paying, and they just like, yeah, randomize it. Actually, that's not incentive compatible, as we've seen. As a block proposer, I want to induce people to pay me more. So I, I might say, okay, decreasing price is better for me. But let's, say, let's assume it's incentive compatible. It would be also wasteful. So as we think I heard, I think from Harry Jules, but I don't remember, uh, his strategy, which is spray and pray. So if I know the block proposer is randomizing uh, the transaction order, my incentive as a user is to just like blast the proposer with many, many transactions. So basically spam them. So I, I try the arbitrage a million times and I hope that one of them lands on the first slot. And this is obviously super wasteful, both in terms of bandwidth and also in terms of what transactions eventually get included. Another possibility is quite discussed uh, nowadays, the idea of first come, first serve. So if there is an arbitrage, okay, it seems fair that the first person who's able to access the information is the one that should get the money. And so what you're trying to say here is the block proposer just keeps a record of when they received the transactions and they pack the block uh, yeah, in, in chronological order of transaction reception. That, however, has some advantages, but it does induce what we call latency games, where now users or arbitrageurs are trying to be as fast as possible to get their transaction to the block proposer. And so if there's a, a million dollar of arbitrage to be captured, they're going to spend a million dollar to build like a fiber optic cable under New Jersey, uh, the example you know from high frequency trading. And so most of the value that is just there to be picked up on chain, it just flows out of the system and, and now it's invested in, in infrastructure. Which has good sides, you have a fast network, but on the other hand, it, it, it feels like you can do maybe better than this. Another way is private channels. So simple user and proposer collusion. So let's say I'm an arbitrager. I know the next block proposer. And I say, you know, put my transaction in the first slot. I'll pay you like some amount of money. That existed. Uh, there were some ways of expressing these preferences to the, to the block proposers. But that model, let's say, favors what we call dark pools. So where the execution, where the transactions are kept privately or vertical integration between these arbitragers and these proposers or exclusive order flow, where the proposers are capturing uh, some transactions and, and not others. And so a generalization of this model is, is just an idea of an auction. So what if as a block proposer, I know my first lot is variable, 
I know there's going to be a ton of people competing for it. I just do an auction. I try to get a sense of, okay, how much are you willing to pay me for this first slot at the top of the block? So what we call this is bundles. So we can think of them as bundles of transactions that are trying to be included at the top of the block. And this was realized as the Flashbots auction. Yeah? Question. In, in the, um, I mentioned that basically the, the, um, the, the arbitrageurs wants to be fast in sending their transactions to more, more proposers. So I'm thinking, uh, do you also observe that they strategize on the time? Because like now, especially with proof of stake, the time when the next block will be constructed is more predictable. Yeah. As a result, maybe I want to submit my transaction to you towards the very end. Correct. Yeah, yeah, so time does come as a factor for first come, first serve, or it's even randomized or private channels, like you want to be faster. The idea of using auction models is you don't have this dependence of time. Like you're able to batch a set of preferences, and it doesn't matter when you receive them, it doesn't matter when you're fast. If the auction is private, and yeah, there's no like bit sniping of these types of phenomenons, you're trying to make influence of time as weak as possible. Right. With, uh, if you think about the flashbots. If you think of flashbots. If you think about the PPS. Um, ah, okay, okay. Yeah, we'll come to that. <laughs> One more question about this. Do yes. flashbots they only auction the very top and the rest you just fill in with random stuff? Or Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, indeed, flashbots, I, I'll get to that in, in the next slide. But yeah, what I want to say is that's one thing that's out of the purview of the Ethereum protocol. That's the, the block ordering. So the Ethereum protocol controls the validators to some extent, but block ordering is something that the protocol doesn't concern itself with. Uh, yeah. Hack tip. Uh, a month ago, two people presented why you should care about maximal extractable value. What I describe here is very related to this, but I want to give you like more of a critical <coughs> perspective on all of this. And for what's the structure of these arbitrages and how do you think about it in terms of, yeah, what's the user side of, of this question, uh, definitely encourage you to check out the talk that they've done at, the, at this seminar series. And so, yeah, as Shamak was asking, um, what happens then? This is actually a model that held in proof of work. So until the merge, which was last September, I'll talk about what ha is happening now, but indeed, the auction, what was being auctioned off is the ability for these searchers, so people who make bundles, to put their bundles ahead of everyone in the block. And so the searcher says, well, there's a million dollar opportunity in my, in my bundle. I'm trying to, I'll bid for you, the block proposer, to include me, and I'll give you maybe 500,000 out of my bundle. If the auction is very competitive, you should expect that the searchers have to give away most of the value of the arbitrage towards the, the block proposal. So this worked in proof of work. In proof of stake, the model is now different. Um, is, I, I won't go into the details why exactly, but the main idea is in proof of stake, we now have what we call solo validators. So people who are just staking, let's say from their living room, and uh, they are not trusted. The previous auction really relied on searchers and block proposers basically maintaining a private network between one another where they were making this auction. You can't do that when you have untrusted solo validators. The reason why these miners were trusted in proof of work is in proof of work you rarely solo mine, you just join a proof of work uh, mining pool. And then the pool is responsible for making the block. You're only providing your hash rate. And so the Flashbots auction network was only running between these whitelisted mining pools and a set of searchers. That doesn't work in, in proof of stake. And so now the idea is, instead of getting... Just to clarify, the issue with the trust there is they see your private transaction and, and they front on it, something like that. Yeah. So searchers are sending like valuable arbitrage. They're basically giving you the recipe for doing the arbitrage. If they don't trust the other party to include the arbitrage as is without like replacing the arbitrage for their own profit, then yeah, they won't send it at all. No. And so now in proof of stake, we move to this model where instead we have full blocks from the from the builder. That allows 
um, this auction to happen. <coughs> builders tell you, I have a block which is worth like 10 ETH and I'm willing to give you 9 ETH of the value as a, as a proposer. And so builders compete against one another to provide the most value to the, to the proposer from the block. This is again uh, an auction. Yeah. So in this framework, how would you ensure the trust between the builders and users or the searchers? Because now the builders can yeah. act actually as the previous proposers to insert their own transactions to from run and see the searchers. Yes. Very interesting question. So what you see here is basically three markets that are interconnected with one another. There's the proposers and the builders, builders and the searchers, the searchers and the users. How the model works between builders and searchers is, I think, pretty close to how it works between searchers and proposers in proof of work. So searchers and builders, they're fairly, they're usually like reputable entities in the sense of you know who they are. So searchers, they, they want to send their bundles to builders because builders will include them in their block. But builders, they want to get good bundles from searchers because that allows them to make good bids to the proposer. And so if I'm a builder and I screw one of the searchers by replacing their arbitrage with mine or I front run the searcher, that searcher will say, okay, I'm not going to send you my bundles anymore because I can't trust you. And as a builder, you just lose access to valuable uh, bundle flow. And so that's, that's kind of the trust model that exists. Here. But there's a lot of things that can be said about the specifics of these different layers. So um, before we have the tips and the, um, the validator keeps the tips, here do the validators go to the builder or they pass through, or, sorry, do the tips go to the builder? Where, where do the tips go? Yeah, so the tips are user transactions that pay a priority fee through EIP1559. And so that tip goes to whomever makes the block. In this paradigm, who makes the block is the builder, but the builder is, has the incentive to give away the tip to the, to the proposer. Okay. So, yeah, so the tip, and think of it. So what happens on paper, the builder keeps all the tips, and then separately the builder is going to decide how much to pay the... Uh... Correct, yeah. But assuming, let's say, all builders receive the same order flow, like they have a public mempool, then they can't keep any of the tip to themselves right. because the competition problem. forces them to, to give away the tip. And so the tip flows back to the block proposer. So in, in a way, the economic mechanism is the same as when you have legends. Because the, in the end, because of competition, all the fees are kept by the architecture, uh, by the validators. Yeah, yeah. The value flows. And then just a question about <laughs> yeah. For the builders, me, do, do they submit to all validators? <coughs> I, I'll talk about this yeah, in, a, in a few slides, yeah, to talk a bit more about the market structure of this. But yeah, first on the, on the value flow, indeed. So that's, I would say that's the ideal picture, is, is none of the value or very little of the value, like the marginal benefit that these parties provide is kept in the cup. But otherwise, the value through these interconnected auctions just flows from the searchers to the, to the proposer. Yeah, I think it's a nice way of thinking about it. Um, right. Let me skip that. So, yeah. Maybe there's two ways of making your block in proof of stake. You can decide to forego entirely this builder thing and to make your block locally with transactions you see in your pool. Or you can summon this external network of, of builders and, and um, yeah, that, that make the blocks. And so to your question, how do builders send these blocks to the proposers? How it's done today is a completely out of protocol market mechanism, which is called MEFBoost. And this is essentially operationalized by these actors in the middle that are called relays. So you can think of relays as brokers. When the builder is making the bid, they say, I have a very good value block. I don't want to tell you, the proposer, what the block is, because you might steal it. Uh, but I, I tell you that it, it has good value. Here's a bid for it. What happens is the builder sends the block to the relay. The relay checks that the block is indeed valid, and that it pays what the bid uh, declares the value to be. And then it tells the, the validator, <coughs> Yeah, I got this really nice block, which is 10 effect. Do you want to sign on it? And so the validator collects these bids from the relays and just selects whatever bid is the maximum <coughs> bid. There's no answers to this, but essentially that's how the, the model works. And so the validator is, is free to connect to whichever relay they want. Uh, in some relays, there's, there's a bit of market differentiation between the different relays. So some relays, they promise to not front run users. Some relays, they censor certain transactions. 
the users have full control over which relays they, they connect to, and so which bids they receive <coughs> from this uh, builder market. And as a builder, I want to submit to all relays because my intention is to get yeah. transactions. I mean, what matters that it reaches the validator at the end? So as a builder, you might want to send to all relays, but some relays might not want your blocks. Like if, if, if you front run users in your block, some relays might say, yeah, we don't do that here. We don't forward your bid. Uh, yeah, but yeah, there is maybe an incentive to, to send your bid as largely as possible. Okay, so that's a bit about PBS and how it's done in practice. And then there's this idea that I think is kind of interesting to think about is what exactly does the protocol see? So what I was saying is all of this very complex thing is happening completely outside of the protocol. Protocol has no idea that validators are sourcing their blocks from this very complex network. You said like, if, yeah. for example, I have some iPhone running users, then the relay may not want to apply. I can understand that if I front run a searcher, so next time the searchers may not want to submit to me, but yeah. if I'm front running users, the relay, why, why would the relay care about that? Some builders just declare that they, anything is game, and like sandwiches, for instance, are fine with them. And then the relays will say, we don't accept blocks from that builder. Because the front running is bad. Yes. Yeah. It's a philosophical choice. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like uh, an economic choice before. Yeah. And again, here I'm really talking about the protocol perspective. So I, I'm almost agnostic to the, where the value comes from. There's many, many like very interesting work done on how do you avoid sandwiches? How do you make sure that front running is like not possible, etc. All of this happens, I would say, at a different level of the pipeline. I'm, I'm really mostly interested at this intersection. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, what does the protocol see? And the question is, well, PBS today is expressed out of protocol via this net boost. You have these relays which are trusted parties, like brokers. They validate the goods that are being sold. They provide payment guarantees to the proposer in case of a builder failure. But is this enough? Like, should the protocol recognize that, okay, actually MevBoost today is used by 90% of the validators, so most of the proposers on the network are using this external builder network. Should the, should the protocol do something about it? Like, should it recognize that it exists and, and provide some kind of mechanism in protocol for, for this separation? Is that what it looks like tomorrow, basically? So I was saying relays are sort of the brokers of these deals. Like, can we make the protocol to be the broker? be the one that organizes this market and makes this meeting place between uh, builders and validators. In other words or pictures, um, where do we draw the boundary of the Ethereum protocol? Like this is the today, so validators are delegating their block construction to these builders. Like should we push the boundary of the protocol so that it, it recognizes builders as, okay, there are people who are participating in our protocol, they, they should be seen and they should be entrenched as, as, as entities that are part of that um, enterprise. The first question is, why delegate? So what is the opportunity in having this separation? The first type of builder separation, which is the execution payload separation, so backing the transactions, it kind of happened to the protocol. And it's, that's why it's out of protocol. That's how you have this MevBoost external market. Like we didn't design for it, it just happened. Uh, but perhaps there is a natural division of labor. And maybe if we lean into it, we can get some benefits out of it. And the reason why is it seems like there's an asymmetry between making a block. So you have to summon like maybe good algorithms for doing good arbitrage, efficient packing, providing resources um, in, the, in the first place. So making a block is kind of difficult, but... <laughs> you don't have to have a whole network do that. So you can have very low powered uh, proposers who get very high hardware, great people, builder, um, to, to make the block. As long as the rest of the network can agree that the block is, is valid, that's fine. And so the builders that are very efficient, very optimized, can be summoned for this one-shot block construction. And then once the work is done, other validators in the system, which are, have much lower resources, they can verify that the builder did the thing properly, that the block is valid, or that they've provided the resources they said they would. This allows 
in particular that all proposers receive commensurate rewards. So for instance, proposers such as Coinbase or Lido, they have much more capital, they might be very good at building blocks, they might even have order flow. If these entities are making great blocks, they're going to get much higher rewards than validators who are staking from their living room. And in that case, over time, you should see that the wealth starts to concentrate in the hands of these trusted or sophisticated proposers. And this hurts the decentralization. So delegating and having this network provide work for all the network fairly can be an opportunity to, to lean into it. And so this, this, might, this is one reason why proposal builder separation might be nice. I'll skip this slide, but another reason has to do with data availability. You can provide a ton of it, much more than the uh, data gas market I was talking about before. And you can't really do that without a builder, so that's good. But of course, there are risks. So when you have outsourcing, when you have agents and you are the principal, the agent might not do the thing that you want them to do. In particular, one thing that we definitely want in, in the Ethereum network is censorship resistance. So the ideal of the Ethereum protocol, which again, there's no way to check that proposers do that, is you need to include any and all transaction that pays fee. But when, as a protocol, you outsource block production to your proposers, they might decide to censor transactions. So your hope here, or kind of your strength, is that the proposer set is very decentralized, there's many people staking, many block proposers, they all have different preferences in terms of transaction inclusion, so eventually someone is going to include the transaction and you have censorship resistance as a network property. But now if you have this extra step where the proposer is delegating to builders, and again, builders, we think of them as very high powered, very sophisticated, so much less decentralized than the proposer set. Now builders might say, okay, I have my own preferences. I don't want this transaction to, to go through and they might censor it. And so the solution is you can maybe get the proposer to require the inclusion of some transactions. So they could tell the builder, okay, when you make your block, please include this transaction <coughs> that I really care about. But then they might scare away some builders that say, oh, okay, I don't actually want to satisfy these preferences, so I won't make the block for you. And then the proposer might hurt their reward. So there's a bit of a trade-off here. Uh, okay, so finishing on this, sorry, I'm a bit over time. But the, I, I think now of proposal builder separation as two things. So ways of, for the protocol to get involved in. So you have this market structure, which is you, yeah. I'm thinking, why wouldn't the incentive of the proposal and the builder be aligned? Because wouldn't they both want to maximize the MEV? Um, some builders might maximize the MEV, but still not want to include some transactions, which is the case today. Some builders are very efficient. They have great value in their blocks, but they refuse to include some transactions in which case there's a trade-off between being censorship resistance and being profit maximizing. What, what is one reason why you, you may not want to include some transactions? Like if it comes from spectrum, some address? Yeah, local sanctions if you are a registered builder. So builders, again, are centralized, high-powered entities, so they might have some legal entity in the world that is attackable. Yeah, <coughs> some reasons might be there. Yeah. But it's what we see in practice today. So, yeah, so being a bit finer, like where do we draw the boundary of a protocol? We could decide to recognize that there are builders, like there are third parties in our system, and that's a good thing because they allow the system to have great blocks, uh, more efficient um, economic use of, of the resources. Another thing that the protocol can do, which is like a step beyond, is fully specify the space of contracts that proposers and builders enter into. So when we design PBS, we can ask ourselves, well, is it a whole block auction? Are we auctioning off the whole block to the builder? Are we letting the proposer make part of it and auctioning the rest to the builder? Do we sell the rights to make the block in advance? Do we have some inclusion list for censorship resistance? There's many like design parameters that the protocol can um, add in this allocation mechanism. And the question that we've asked in this workshop last week is, that what's a good way to, to do it, basically? And, and where do we draw the, the boundary? So what this leads us to query is, what is Ethereum? Like, what's Ethereum as a protocol, and where do the concerns of Ethereum as a protocol stop? Is it at the client level? Like, do we just say, okay, the situation today is not so bad, MethBoost is a fairly reliable piece of software, 
We can provide more ways for out-of-protocol markets to organize, like we can provide monitoring to check that the market is, is doing well um, and, and stop there. Like we, we are blind to the separation. We could say, okay, we are going to recognize that there are builders in our system. We're going to build fail safes in case the builder goes offline in the middle of making the deal with the proposer so that the proposer is compensated, which is not possible today with the out-of-protocol market. In this case, we might ask, is there a moral hazard? Like if we backstop proposers from engaging with risky builders, uh, do we increase the probability that these proposers are going to get into risky behaviors? Or do we go even further and go to the allocation mechanism and try as a protocol to determine all markets and all allocation mechanisms uh, for this proposer builder separation? This might be dangerous because, again, we don't want to change the protocol too often. Uh, we want eventually to ossify and to not have to completely switch parameters. And these market structures might change over time. We might not have builders in 10 years when cryptography makes leaps and bounds and, and provides great ways of packing blocks privately. So, yeah, these are questions that I'm thinking about and I'm encouraging you to think about them as well. And I'm always happy to, to chat about them. Um, I have more on this topic in a recent post that I published. Uh, and otherwise, always feel free to write me an email and I'm happy to, to discuss more about all this. Thank you.